Okay, good morning. Good morning. We are coming up on the 60th anniversary of the assassination of John F. Kennedy. I was seven years old, and I remember being in a little deli uh, when um, I heard the news that Kennedy was assassinated. Uh, at seven years old, you're not able to process it. Um, today, 60 years later, only 17% of the American population was born when, or was alive when Kennedy was assassinated. Uh, so most people have no idea what happened that day. And I could ask you where you were that day, because you probably remember where you were that day. It was one of those days. But uh, the end of Camelot, November 22nd, 1963, was just one event in 1963. Martin Luther King, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. addressed a quarter of a million people in Washington, D.C., the March for Freedom, with the I Have a Dream speech. Uh, in Vietnam, there were American troops there. In fact, there had been American troops there for already eight years. Uh, the Civil Rights Movement continued in the South, the American South. There were sit-ins and no service. This is uh, your typical Woolworth counter uh, in the South, where a lot of the sit-ins took place. And there's Martin Luther King, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I didn't realize how short he was until I went to the Martin Luther King Center in Atlanta, and they had his clothes laying out there. And his clothes were not for, didn't seem like they were for adults, but he was a, a, a really small guy, took small sizes. Here he is in Birmingham after being arrested uh, in April 1963. There was the space race, which as a kid, hey, hey, that was great, we're going to the moon. I didn't realize as a kid, it was a military operation. And who was going to control space with tactical weapons? Soviets sent up the first woman astronaut, Valentina Treshkikova. John F. Kennedy was in Berlin, addressing a crowd of West Berliners. George Wallace blocked the door at the University of Alabama, not allowing African-American students to attend the University of uh, Alabama. And Beatlemania started in 1963. 1963, the Beatles in England had their first number one hit. 2023, the Beatles have a number one hit, 60 years later. And the band has been gone since 1969, and two of the members are dead, Yet they're number one on the charts. Uh, that's Dallas. That's, you can't really pick me out, but uh, I'm right here in this picture in the shadows. That's where Lee Harvey Oswald uh, was. Um, on November 22nd, 1963, that is the School Book Depository Building. And I might ask this question, was the Kennedy assassination the end of the 1950s innocence? Well, I don't even know if there was an innocence in the 1950s other than there's that perceived perception that the 50s were a time of innocence. Uh, this is Bronxville, New York, and um, John F. Kennedy did not grow up in Boston or Brookline, Massachusetts. He grew up on, in Bronxville, New York on Pondfield Road, a place called the Crown's Nest uh, off of Pondfield Road, which is now six separate houses, and Joe Kennedy lived there. Uh, along with Rose and all the kids, and Jack Kennedy was there from 1927 until he went to college. Uh, he was 10 years old when he moved to Bronxville. Bobby Kennedy was three years old. Ted Kennedy uh, was born in Bronxville in 1932, and uh, Joe Kennedy may have saved Bronxville from like, economic ruin uh, in the 1930s after the Depression. But that came with a price. Um, societies bought houses and people were kept out. Uh, Jews were kept out, and blacks were kept out under Joe Kennedy's rules. But that's where uh, Joe Ken John Kennedy grew up. And uh, that's a little monument that was put up for uh, John Kennedy in 2017. And it talks about his years in Bronxville. And at the bottom of that monument, it says uh, local newspaper headline. Local man, elected president of the United States, November 1960, and that's it. You don't know anything else about Kennedy, at least according to that. That was the last uh, monument put up to Kennedy in all the towns that he lived in 
uh, and he lived in Bronxville. He went to uh, Riverdale uh, uh, School, uh, Riverdale Country Day School, and uh, one of his professors uh, was a guy by the name of uh, Charles McNeil, who invented the point spread in football, made football popular. Uh, anyway, 1963. Well, the Cuban Missile Crisis, that's over. It's in the rearview mirror. But there are Cold War tensions between the U.S. and the USSR. Uh, the two countries install a hotline between Moscow and Washington. There are 15,000 American advisors stationed in South Vietnam, 15,000, uh, all of whom uh, were volunteers or, or, or enlisted in the uh, Army. Uh, the Civil Rights Movement continues with demonstrations in American southern states. And is uh, right before Dwight Eisenhower leaves the presidency and John Kennedy takes over. And John Kennedy is briefed on what's going on in Vietnam. And the Americans have supported uh, Diem, who is, uh, the, for lack of better words, a dictator in South Vietnam, thinking that he's the only guy who's preventing South Vietnam from falling to the communists, and there is the end. Uh, so he's the US guy. Uh, the Americans start aiding South Vietnam in 1955. French pulled out of Vietnam or Indochina in 1954 because they had to uh, see what was going on, or they had to take care of what was going on in Angola which was about ready to uh, fall into a civil war. Uh, Diane was able to take hundreds of thousands of refugees from North Vietnam and relocate them in the South. But he was a Catholic, and uh, he didn't particularly uh, like Buddhists, or at least the Buddhists felt that way. Most of South Vietnam were uh, Buddhists. And uh, because he was Roman Catholic, that made him unacceptable to the Buddhists, who were the overwhelming majority. Now, uh, there was this thing called the uh, domino theory, uh, which you might have learned in school. And basically, it was this. Uh, that is the uh, hand of, uh, say, Stalin or Khrushchev. And they are going to knock down all these dominoes. Laos, of course, then South Vietnam, then Taiwan then South Korea, then the Philippines, then Japan, Canada, and the United States. Actually, it was Laos, in Eisenhower's view, that was the real problem in Indochina, not South Vietnam. He might have been partially right about that. Kennedy, as a senator in 1956, advocated U.S. involvement in Vietnam. Uh, in uh, 1954, in Dwight Eisenhower's view, the loss of Vietnam, South Vietnam, uh, to uh, communist control would lead to similar communist victories in neighboring countries uh, in Southeast Asia, including Laos and Cambodia and Thailand, and elsewhere, India, Japan, Philippines, Indonesia, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, this year starts with American casualties. Now, there have been American casualties, or were American casualties, in South Vietnam or Vietnam, uh, since 1955. Remember, my father once telling me he was drafted, um, he was born in 1932, went into the Army in 1953. Korea had wound down by then, or at least it was a truce. And uh, he fully expected to go to South Vietnam under Eisenhower. And Eisenhower turned and decided not to send good many troops to South Vietnam. But uh, these three guys are killed. It's called the Ap Bec battle, and it's January 2nd, and the Viet Cong claimed the victory after it shot down five U.S. helicopters, and an American officer was killed, three other servicemen were injured. The Battle of Op Bac was the first major combat victory by the Viet Cong against the South Vietnamese uh, Army of the Republic of Vietnam and U.S. forces. This is a napalm blast. Napalm is rather nasty. It burns the skin. Uh, and napalm would be a central part of, uh, starting 1967, demonstrations on campuses. Uh, at the University of Wisconsin, uh, DuPont, who was, or Dow Chemicals, uh, they were uh, making napalm. They came onto the campus were looking to recruit future scientists, and they were met with uh, protests. Uh, it wasn't against the Vietnam War at that point. It was against the maker of napalm. And, Things escalated from there. Meanwhile, there's George Wallace, 
He's the new governor of Alabama. He's a segregationist. And he takes office on January 16, 1963. In his inaugural address, he promises segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. On January 16th, Nikita Khrushchev, the Soviet leader, visits East Germany to take a look at the Berlin Wall. Uh, and he also addresses the communist leadership of East Germany at the SED Party Congress. And he claimed at the time that the USSR had a 100 megaton nuclear bomb, which, uh, do I have a desk here? Well, remember how many we used to go like this, right? You would hide under a desk, right? And I had teachers like Mrs. Feinstein who said, get under the desk. I said, why? I said, six, seven years old. I said, if they're going to kill me, why don't I just get killed standing up? Just get under the desk. Well, years later, I found out why you went under the desk. First of all, the radiation goes upward. There may be less radiation on the ground. Also, they put you under the desk to try to shield you from shrapnel. And also, you went like that to protect your head and your face. But Mrs. Feinstein never told me that. Uh, things that you don't learn in second grade. Uh, there is Mao Zedong. He is the leader of communist China, or red China. We don't call it red China anymore, right? When I was a kid, especially Stewie Gates, who was my teacher in ninth grade. Red China, red China, red China, communist China. We don't call the country of red China anymore. Anyway, so there's Mao Zedong, there's Khrushchev, and they're at each other's throats uh, because who is the more pure communist? Is it Nikita Khrushchev, who went to Disneyland in 1959 and went to Hollywood Studios in 1959? Or is it Mao Zedong? Who is the, who is the true communist? Uh, in uh, June, officials from the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China, they meet <coughs> in Moscow, and the uh, Chinese government was critical <coughs> of Nikita Khrushchev talking about the counter-revolutionary trends in the Soviet Union. China was unhappy with the Soviets' uh, policy of cooperation in the West. Uh, nuclear test ban agreement uh, is signed by the U.S. and the USSR. Uh, that uh, was uh, after the Senate ratified it on October 10, 1963, and uh, the agreement banned the above-ground testing of nuclear weapons. You probably have never heard of this guy. His name is Harvey Gantt. He actually ran for Senate in 1992 in North Carolina against the segregationist Jesse Helms. He lost. But uh, he was the last person to desegregate a school in the South. Uh, he enters Clemson University on uh, January 28th. Uh, and South Carolina was the last state to hold out against racial dis uh, discrimination. Um, on May 28th, students and faculty from the Tugaloo College uh, staged a sit-in at the Woolworths lunch counter in Jackson, Mississippi. They were beaten by police. Um, they were beaten. Um, police watched. Didn't do anything. I knew a guy by the name of Fred. He was with United Press International, member of the New York Press Club, of which I'm a member. And uh, he was down in the South between 1958 and 1962. He said the police were in on virtually all of the violence in the South. They were part of it. Police were part of the Ku Klux Klan. Fred uh, was told he, by UPI, we're t relieving you of this assignment. We're sending you back to New York. He was getting death threats for writing this and in, uh, in, in, uh, reporting this back in the late 50s, early 60s. He was Jewish, and that also was a strike against him, and they decided that they had to get him out because UPI was fearful that this guy was going to be beaten up one day or worse yet killed. Hoping to avoid further disturbances, the owner of the Jackson Woolworth closed the lunch counter shortly after the sit-in. Any of you read this book, Feminine Mistake? Betty for that. It is the start of the women's live movement. Um, she lived up in Grandview on the Hudson, Rockland County, just south of uh, the Tappan Zee Bridge. She was a writer, and she wrote about a whole bunch of things, freelance writer for magazines, supplementing her husband's income. And uh, she wanted to write an article for a magazine 
about her life and how unfulfilled she felt she was. Um, but they said no. They thought she was going crazy, the magazine editors. She was writing about the gradual change of American women from independent, career-minded women of the 1920s, the flappers, the flappers who went out and got jobs, went into business, went out at night, had a good time, uh, and into the early 1930s, who all of a sudden became vacant, uh, aproned uh, housewives of post-war years. Uh, raise your kid, don't have a job, be a good housewife, all that other stuff. Although, there is something about that. In the 1950s, there were more women in the workplace in the, in the United States than any other time previous to that, except for World War II. And there is Betty Friedan. She had gone to the 15th, uh, 15th reunion of her graduating class at Smith College in 1957. Uh, and she decided, uh, she's talking and talking and talking, and um, she's asking, you know, what have you done with your life? I've had babies. I watch TV. I clean furniture. Uh, what she discovered, the women uh, responses were uh, nameless, aching dissatisfaction. And she would call it the problem that has no name. She sent out the same questionnaire to uh, graduates uh, Radcliffe and other colleges and basically got the same answers. Um, they were dissatisfied. They were educated, but they couldn't get jobs. Oh yeah, you can be a secretary, and you can be a teacher, you can be a bell telephone operator, you can be a librarian, but you couldn't be much more than that unless you were Lucille Ball who basically ran Desilu Productions by 1962. But what she found would become a book, or the foundation of a book, uh, about the problem that women had. It would uh, also kickstart the women's lib movement, and the book also pushed Congress. That's Gloria Steinem. Gloria Steinem was Playboy Bunny, 1963. She was doing an article for a magazine. Now, before I get into Gloria Steinem, I'm going to give you a little story about me. Uh, I went out with a woman. Her name was Charlene Amalek, who was Miss Rockland County, New York, in 1977 and 1978. And uh, we were going out, and we were talking about you know, the pageant and winning Miss Rockland County, and going up to New York State, to, to Rochester, and to the pageant. And uh, I said, uh, so what'd you have to do? And she looks at me and she says, what size shoes do you take? I said, 12. She said, That's, that doesn't do. So well, why do you need that? She said, I wanted to show you how you have to walk, you know, how you impress the judges, lecherous men, the judges. And you know, she puts on the high-heeled shoes, and she starts swinging back and forth. Um, and I said, oh. And I said, you do that on the catwalk. She said, I had to do it on the catwalk. Now, she was competing for a $1,000 scholarship. Officially, the Miss America pageantry back then was you're competing for a college scholarship. That's what it was supposed to be about. Anyway, so uh, she shows me the law. And she says, uh, to me, I said, well, what are some of the tricks of the trade? She said, well, I can go from a 34B to a 36C within a couple seconds by stuffing. And if I really wanted to stuff my rear end, I could stuff my rear end too. I also put Vaseline on my teeth, because if you put Vaseline on your teeth, your lips all, all of a sudden are kind of like this. So you smile all the time. That's where you look and you see that there's some gloss on the teeth. And she said, that's what you did. Those were the tricks of the trade. And then you got out there and you hoped that you could attract enough votes from the lecherous judges who were 55-year-old men looking. Charlene, is, uh, Charlene was a uh, year older than me, so she'd be 68 now. Back then in 1977, she was 21. She was 21 at the time. Uh, so she told me all this. And this is 1978. Let's go back to 1963. And Gloria Steinem is a Playboy bunny. And let's see how, much, how many things changed in 15 years. Uh, Gloria Steinem, political activist. 
She created New York and Ms. Magazines. She was the co-founder of the National Women's Political Caucus, Free to Be Foundation, Women's Media Center, Women's Action Alliance. She was a journalist, and she went undercover for Show Magazine to see what it was really like to work at New York City's Playboy Club at 5 East 59th Street. The world she found was one of stuffed bosoms, uh, low pay, high heels. The story ran in show's May and June issues, a story called A Bunny's Tale. Nothing had changed. She was a Playboy Bunny. I also dated a Playboy Bunny. Not long, but I also dated a Playboy Bunny as well. Uh, kind of my unusual life. Um, anyway, not much had changed. Um, basically, Gloria Steinem went there uh, to see what it was like to be objectified for a living. Charlene Annelick was in a beauty pageant, uh, objectified for a living. But a change would come. Equal Pay Act. Do you think that women should get the same salaries as men with the same experience for the same job? Yes or no? Yes. Do you know, in 1961, the Spanish dictator, the fascist, uh, Francisco Franco, 1961, signed Equal Pay Act, which meant women were equal to men in Spain, same job, same experience. That wasn't the case in the United States. Uh, the 1963 uh, Equal Pay Act was signed into law June 10th by Kennedy. Congress stated that sex discrimination depresses wages and living standards for employees, prevents the maximum utilization of available labor resources. The law has never been enforced evenly. The women's movement would become the second civil rights movement of the 1960s in the United States. Oh, uh, Saddam Hussein comes onto the scene in 1963, and it's the beginning of four decades of uh, the United States involvement with Saddam. The Ramadan Revolution, or the February 8th Revolution, was a coup d'etat uh, in Iraq, a military coup by the Ba'ath Party's Iraqi wing, which overthrew the five-year-old uh, regime of the president of Iraq, Ab Hakim Qasim. Saddam Hussein would return to Iraq after four years of exile in Egypt uh, with the Ba'ath Party taking power. See, uh, Saddam was thrown out of uh, Iraq because he was part of a plot to try and kill al Karim Qasim. So you're now talking about 64 years ago that Saddam first got in trouble. And then uh, that guy on the right, uh, well, uh, um, he, his family is still running uh, the, uh, Syrian, uh, in, uh, the Syrian government. Uh, uh, his name uh, was uh, uh, Hafaz al-Assad. His son is uh, running uh, Syria. This is 1963. And the March uh, Revolution was engineered by the committee, a military committee, of the Syrian regional branch. Sounds like a bank, right? of the Arab Socialist Ba'ath Party. The coup was planned by the military committee rather than the Ba'ath civilian leadership. But um, Michelle Aflac, uh, the leader of the party, consented to the conspiracy. Uh, the leading members in the military committee took power. They included Mohammed Uram, Salah Yahid, uh, and uh, Salah Jahid, and uh, Hafaz al-Assad. Now, John Kennedy, John Kennedy, was a politician. That's what he was. And he is looking to run for re-election in 1964. So he's using this calculus as how do I get how do I get re-elected in 1964? Well what do I do? I got a civil rights movement. I got the Vietnam uh, situation in Vietnam. What am I supposed to do? Because I gotta win votes. And how do I win votes and help the civil rights cause or get the troops out of Vietnam? John Kennedy was slow in supporting the civil rights movement in 1961 and 1962. In uh, 1961, JFK would eventually support the freedom rights movement, 
uh, to a certain extent, the Kennedy brothers were able to end segregation on interstate buses in November 1961. 1962, James Meredith attempts to go to the University of Mississippi. Uh, and the federal government backed his right to attend the University of Mississippi, but the segregational governor or segregationist governor of Mississippi, Worst Barnett, vowed to block Meredith from attending classes. Meredith once again tried to register uh, for classes, this time with federal marshals at his side. Rioting erupted on campus. Two people were killed. Kennedy sends federal troops to the campus. Meredith is able to attend class after a riot. In November 1962, Kennedy did issue an executive order to end housing discrimination. But Kennedy ignored calls from civil rights leaders, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Ralph Abernathy, and others, uh, that he would introduce civil rights legislation. Kennedy never introduced any civil rights legislation. This is the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. Now you would think the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan would only be about cars. It's also about American society. And Henry Ford might be rolling in his grave knowing it's also a civil rights museum considering uh, his anti-Semitism. And this is one of the displays uh, at the Henry Ford Museum, a Ku Klux Klan a rally. Uh, also, they depict a time in America where if you went to a train station or a bus station, well, there was the white waiting room and there was a colored waiting room. The white waiting room in here is painted. The colored waiting room looks like it's got uh, mildew and mold all over the place. Two Americas. Two Americas. Uh, Penn Station in New York. Penn Station in New York had different water fountains. One for whites and one for colored. Uh, and that was in Midtown Manhattan as late as 1963. Now Martin Luther King is going to jail in April. Going to jail for demonstrating. He's arrested in Birmingham. And uh, there he is, prisoner 7089. And he writes a letter in, from the Birmingham jail. It's April 12th, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on Good Friday violated a court injunction prohibiting public civil rights demonstrations in Birmingham, Alabama. Local police officers arrested King and a handful of protesters, including the Reverend Ralph Anthony and transported them to the Birmingham City Jail, where 40 years earlier, the prisoner had penned a mournful folk ballad about the place that included the line, write me a letter, send it by mail, send it in care of the Birmingham Jail. Well, why did Martin Luther King write this letter? Well, he was answering white ministers who were saying, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this in Birmingham? Well, he gave the pieces of paper to his lawyer, uh, and it became known as the Letters from Birmingham Jail. It's probably the most important document that was written during the Civil Rights era. What was he doing? He was fighting injustice. Now, the first, uh, the first that Americans ever learned of Martin Luther King, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, but he was only Martin Luther King Jr. then in 1946, was a letter to the editor of an Atlanta paper where he basically said he was fighting injustice. Now, the images of the civil rights movement had been brought into your living room, starting in 1957 when television was able to send cameras out remotely to cover stories. This is Birmingham, Alabama in 1963. Uh, the Birmingham Fire Department uh, with their hoses uh, watering down protesters. Um, Birmingham, Alabama officials' uh, reaction to uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King led demonstrations changed perceptions because of TV, because of TV and cameras. Television caught police beatings of nonviolent marchers, firemen churning their high pressure hoses on defenseless men, women, children. Police dogs shredding the clothing of demonstrators on video. At that time, the New York Times and Southern newspapers 
were ignoring the civil rights movement. New York Times couldn't be bothered by it by that point, even if they had eight columns across, say they only have six columns across. This is the picture that changes John Kennedy's mind. It's a 17-year-old demonstrating, and he is being attacked by a police dog. And that picture is spread across newspapers across the country. Uh, the guy's name is Walter Gadsden. He's 17. He's defying an anti-parade ordinance in Birmingham, Alabama. He's attacked by a police dog on May 3rd. The picture of the dog attack on Gadsden, uh, on Gadsden uh, was taken by a photojournalist. On May 4th, there's a meeting at the White House. Members of a political group are meeting with Kennedy, and he discussed the photo. It was on the cover of the New York Times, and it shakes up John Kennedy. That's more uh, fire hoses being used in Birmingham, Alabama on May 8th. Now, Kennedy is dealing with this. He's also dealing with Vietnam. And he realizes that Vietnam is becoming a quagmire. We don't have a prayer of staying in Vietnam. Kennedy confided to a friend in April. Those people hate us. They're going to throw out our asses at any point. I can't give up the territory to the communists and get the American people reelected. He's made a political decision. He knows that the Vietnam War is terrible and isn't even a war yet. It's a war between the North and South with American advisors. But he's afraid if he pulls out of Vietnam, he's going to be looked at as weak and he's not going to be reelected. So he decides we can't pull out of Vietnam. Kennedy is shaken by what's happened in Birmingham. The world is watching. He's got Vietnam. He's got Birmingham. He's got Birmingham. Keep Birmingham schools white. Uh, Birmingham changed opinions, though. New York Times published more stories about civil rights in uh, those two weeks in Birmingham than it had the previous two years. Televised scenes of children campaigning against rigid segregation being bitten by dogs, knocked off their feet by water, fired with enough power to rip bark off a tree, caused international outrage. International outrage. Uh, so John Kennedy says, you know what? We've got to address the nation. We've got to talk about what is going on in the South. Alabama's governor, George Wallace, came to national prominence where he kept the campaign pledge in the schoolhouse door to block integration of Alabama's public schools. Wallace read the proclamation when he stood in the doorway to block the attempt of two black students, Vivian Malone and James Hood, to register at the University of Alabama. Kennedy uh, federalized the National Guard, Alabama National Guard, ordered its units to uh, the university campus. Wallace stepped aside, went back to the capital of Montgomery, the students uh, entered. He was just a big show. Well, Martin Luther King, Dr. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, and the Southern uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference begins to make plans for summer demonstrations. Uh, on June 11th, the same day as President Kennedy's address to the Nation on Civil Rights, the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference announced plans to demonstrate in Washington for new civil rights legislation. The group calls for a massive, militant, monumental sit-ins on Congress. Massive acts of civil disobedience all over the nation. While Kennedy does do the speech, the administration is dithering. They really don't know what to do. A few hours later, civil rights activist Medgar Evers is killed in Jackson, Mississippi. This Kennedy is joining the civil rights movement. Them. This is why he says on June 11, it ought to be possible for American students of any color to attend any public institution they select without having to be backed up by troops. It ought to be possible for American consumers of any color to receive equal service in places of public accommodation, such as hotels and restaurants and theaters and retail store stores without being forced to resort to demonstrations in the street, and it ought to be possible for American citizens of any color to register and to vote in a free election without interference or fear of reprisal. 
Ought to be possible, in short, for every American to enjoy the privileges of being an American without regard to his race or his color. Notice he doesn't use the uh, word her. Just his. His. How was he thinking in 1963? After all, it was a man's world, wasn't it? Uh, anyway, uh, in short, every American ought to have uh, the right to be treated as he wishes to be treated or as one would wish his children to be treated. But that's not the case. 100 years of delay have passed since President Lincoln freed the slaves, yet their heirs, their grandsons, not their granddaughters, their grandsons, are not fully free. Well, here's Medgar Evers. He's assassinated. Uh, he had been targeted for a long time, but they stepped up, people in the South. And again, that guy Fred Wooden said that everybody in the South Knew the police. They were in on things. Uh, anyway, it's May 28. Molotov cocktail was thrown into the garage of Medgar Edwards' home five days before his death. Uh, he was nearly run down by a car as he emerged from the Jackson, Mississippi NAACP office. Uh, in Jackson, on June 12, Edwards pulled into his driveway after returning from an integration meeting where he had conferred with the NAACP lawyers. Emerging from his car, carrying NAACP t-shirts that stated, Jim Crow must go, Evers was struck in the back with a bullet that ricocheted to his home. He staggered 30 feet before collapsing and dying at a local hospital 15 minutes later. It took 31 years to find his killer. They knew who his killer was immediately, but it took 31 years and three tries. Uh, Evers' killer, Byron De La Bentwick was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. Alex Baldwin starred in a movie about, uh, about Bentwick. Uh, JFK meets with the uh, Evers family. Uh, Evers and his uh, wife, Merle, had established the NAACP office in Jackson, Mississippi in the mid-1950s. He led marches, prayer vigils, voter registration drives, and boycotts. As early as 1955, he was marked for death. Uh, he wanted blacks and whites to get along in Jackson, um, find, the, find the solution to social problems. He orchestrated a boycott of white merchants in Jackson in the early, in the early 1960s. Well, uh, Kennedy's off to Berlin, so his brother Bobby Kennedy addresses protesters on June 14th. Has no answers. Has no answers. John Kennedy's in Berlin, and he's fighting the Cold War here. So he's got Vietnam, he's got the Cold War, he's got the Civil Rights Movement, he's got women wanting equal pay. There's a lot going on right now. Anyway, he makes his uh, Berlin speech uh, in uh, uh, the setting against the Berlin Wall in West uh, Berlin. And he says, there are many people in the world who really don't understand, or say they don't understand, what is the great issue between the free world and the communist world. Let them come to Berlin. There are some who say that communism is the way of the future. Let them come to Berlin. And there are some who say in Europe and elsewhere, we can work with the communists. Let them come to Berlin. And there are even a few who say that it is true, communism is an evil system. But it permits us to make economic progress. Lots of not Berlin coming. Let them come to Berlin. Well, while he's in Berlin, civil rights leaders get together and they're plotting for a summer of demonstrations. The guy to uh, John Kennedy's right, your left, is A. Philip Randolph. He's a forgotten civil rights leader but he had been around for a long time by 1963. Uh, Randolph's planning a march for jobs. King is uh, in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. They're planning one for freedom. Two groups said, hey, let's work together. Randolph and his chief aide, uh, uh, Bayard uh, Rustin, their march would call for a fair treatment and equal opportunity for black Americans as well as the passage of the Civil Rights Act. Randolph had been at this a long time. 1941, why should we march? 15,000 Negroes assembled in St. Louis, Missouri. 20,000 Negroes assembled in Chicago. 23,500 Negroes 
uh, in New York City. Millions of uh, Negro Americans all over this great land claim the right to be free, free from want, free from fear, free from Jim Crow. And he wants Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, to do something. Uh, he had led five marches in Washington. Before 1963, there were three smaller marches for school integration in the 1950s. 1941, with blacks excluded from jobs in the defense industry, Randolph began traveling the country, rallying potential marches, marchers with the message, we loyal Negro citizens demand the right to work and fight for our country. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt invited Randolph to the White House on June 25th, 1941, six days before Randolph's march scheduled to take place, Roosevelt issued Executive Order 8802, banning discrimination in the government and defense industry. These guys have got to be known as the Big Six, and they're in New York in 1963. You can see Randolph, you can see uh, King, also uh, there was Roy Wilkins, along with a very young John Lewis there at the end. Um, six civil rights leaders gathered at the Roosevelt Hotel on July 2nd. King, Randolph, John Lewis, with the young James Farmer, and Roy Wilkins. They became known as the Big Six. It was Randolph who was able to get the six on the same page. And they made demands. These are the, the demands for JFK and Congress. Comprehensive and effective civil rights legislation from the present Congress without compromise or filibuster to guarantee all Americans access to public accommodations, decent housing, adequate and integrated education, the right to vote, withholding of federal funds from all programs in which discrimination exists. And here's a uh, march, and if you can see, there's a kid there, probably my age now, don't treat our children like prisoners. Uh, more demands, desegregation of all school districts in 1963, enforcement of the 14th Amendment, reducing congressional representation of states where citizens are disenfranchised or can't vote. A new executive order banning discrimination in housing supported by federal funds. Authority for the Attorney General to institute injunctive suits when any uh, constitutional right is violated. A massive federal program to train and place all unemployed workers, Negro and white, on meaningful and dignified jobs at decent wages. A national minimum wage act that will give Americans a decent standard of living. A broad and fair labor standards act to include all areas of employment which are presently excluded. A federal fair employment practices act barring discrimination by federal, state, and municipal governments and employers, contractors, employment agency, and trade unions. Well, 1963 is the summer of protest. Here's a protest. Here's another protest. One of the protesters has a raw egg cracked over his head by the guy who owns the establishment. That guy's name was Robert uh, Fensetfeld, and he's the owner of a segregated lunchroom in Cambridge, Maryland, and he douses a white integrationist with water on July 8th. Uh, the integrationist, Edward Dickerson, was among three white and eight African-American protesters who knelt on the sidewalk in front of the restaurant to sing freedom songs. A roar egg, which Fessen felt uh, had broken over Dickinson's head moments earlier, is still visible on the back of Dickerson's head in that picture. All of the protesters were arrested, cracking egg over the guy's head. Uh, well, so, uh, according to the United States Justice Department in the 10 weeks before the August 28th, March on Washington, there were 758 demonstrations, 186 cities, resulting in 14,733 arrests. There's a cross burning in Chicago on August 3rd. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois dies. This is uh, Great Barrington, Massachusetts. This picture was from 2020, at the absolute height of the COVID uh, pandemic. But we went up there anyway. Surgical mask, not one of the good masks. Anyway, uh, there's a little exhibit, outdoor exhibit of uh, the boys. 
1905, the founder and general secretary of the Niagara Movement, an African-American protest group of scholars and professionals. Uh, the Boys founded and edited The Moon, 1906. The Horizon, 1907, uh, 1907 through 1910, which served as ordinance for the Niagara Movement. He would run for Senate in 1950. Uh, 1909, he's among the founders of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Uh, and from 1910 to 1934, he was the director of publicity and research member of the board of directors, founder and editor of The Crisis, the monthly magazine. 1950, he ran for the Senate seat in New York. In the 1950s, his socialist views got in trouble during the McCarthy years. He fled to Ghana. He would die there. He never renounced his American citizenship. He died on August 27, 1963, the night before the Washington March. Quarter of a million people are there protesting. It's August 28, 1963. Uh, Randolph, A. Philip Randolph, leads the day off with a speech. We here today are the only the first wave. When we leave, it will be to carry the civil rights revolution home with us into every nook and cranny of the land. Uh, we shall return again and again to Washington in ever-growing numbers until total freedom is ours. This is what a quarter of a million people look like, even today, even though Washington on the mall certainly changed. The Smithsonian is bigger. That's what a quarter of a million people look like. Uh, other speakers, uh, Bayard Rustin, NAACP President Roy Wilkins, John Lewis of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the civil rights veterans uh, Daisy Lee Bates and the actors Ozzie Davis and Ruby Dee. The march also featured performances from uh, uh, Marian Anderson, Joan Baez, Bob Dylan, still out there, and Mahalia Jackson. And it's Mahalia Jackson who spurs Martin Luther King to give the I Have a Dream speech. Uh, she yells, tell him about the dream, Martin. Tell him about the dream. King originally thought the speech should be low key since he was speaking to a broad audience about controversial things. King looked over the crowd. He explained later in the interview, all of a sudden, this thing came to me that I used. Used it many times before, this thing about I have a dream. I felt that I wanted to use it there. The hell you Jackson yelling, tell him about the dream, tell him about the dream. It didn't come to him. The hell you Jackson is yelling. So King started uh, speaking completely off the cuff, I have a dream. Uh, if you listen to WCBS radio, not too long ago, Jane Tillman Irving and Rich Lamb, two friends of mine in the business, uh, they're pictured here. And uh, Jane went to the uh, March on Washington in 1963. And uh, she was a teenager. And uh, they had to follow something called the Green Book. The Green Book was put out by a guy uh, in Harlem by the name of Victor Green. And basically, it's called the Negro Motorist Green Book. And you took that book to know where you could go and not get in trouble. What hotels you could stay at, what motels you could stay at, what restaurants you could go to, what gas stations you could go to, where you could go without being hassled. And this green book lasted for about 30 years. And Jane Tillman Irving's mother used that green book as they drove down to Washington to watch what was unfolding that day, August 28th. This is what Jane told me about being there. It was an inspiring speech. This is the moment feeling. Then there was reality. America was still a segregated nation. They went to get gas. They were told, we don't serve black people. Gas stations only serve whites in areas. Hotels refuse Negroes. Nothing had changed. Great speech, but nothing had changed. A few weeks later, Birmingham again, the 16th Street Baptist Church is bombed. Oh, again, they knew who did it. Uh, and there's the bomb damage. Uh, it was September 15th, less than three weeks after the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Dynamite bomb planted by Klansmen exploded inside the 16th Street Baptist Church, killing four young girls. 
Adam May Collins, 14, she'd be 74 now. Denise McNair, 11, she'd be 71 now. Carol Robertson, 14, she would be 74 now. Cynthia Wesley, 14, she would also be 74. More than 20 others were injured in the attack. That was a time uh, to occur during a Youth Day tribute to local young people in the Birmingham campaign. Uh, oh, the FBI, well, they concealed evidence, the FBI. Again, Fred could have told you all about this. But uh, the FBI finally turns over evidence. And Robert Chambliss is convicted of murder in 1977. Thomas Blanton in 2001. Bobby Frank Cherry in 2002. The fourth bottom, Herman Cash died in 1994 with ever being indicted. Remember Jay Black and the Americans? The group? David Black, Jay Black, only in America. Well, they had a hit, at least in the New York area, with the song called Only in America. Uh, in April, the Drifters, a rhythm and blues group, recorded a song containing the lyric, Only in America can a kid grow up without a cent and get a break and maybe grow up to be president. Should have been the next hit for the Drifters. But the record was pulled by the Atlantic Records executive, Jerry Wexler. Why was that? Well, because those guys were never going to become president. Wexler observed what was happening in the South. He thought it would be unfeeling, unfair, and unfitting to have a black group release a song about America being the land of opportunity and suggest an African American could become president. Patriotic lyrics replaced Barry Mann and Cynthia Wilde's original words. Cynthia Wilde just died recently. Only in America, land of opportunity, can they save a seat in the back of the bus for me? Only in America, where they preach the golden rule, will they start to march when my kids want to go to school. They pulled those lyrics out. That's the group, the Drifters. Uh, Atlantic record executives told the husband-wife songwriting team of Man and Wild, uh, and they started cranking out songs in 1961, rewrite the lyrics. They refused. Uh, Jerry Lieber and Michael Stoller uh, rewrote the, the lyrics. Wexler gave the song to a prominently Jewish group, Jay and the Americans. The singer, Jay Black, David Black, who's Jewish. In fact, David Black recently, or Jay Black recently died. Uh, he was uh, in Florida doing the circuit, doing a show in both Yiddish and English. Uh, that's what he was there. He also dated the next girlfriend here. Uh, as well, I found that later. Uh, the song was a mid-level chart, uh, hit chart, charting at 25. At the time, no American, no Jew had ever become president. Sam Cooke, change is going to come. October 8th, Sam Cooke and his band, they're arrested after trying to register at a whites-only hotel in Louisiana. In the months following, he records a song, The Change is going to come. Well, the violence comes. That's the change. The violence comes. Diem is assassinated in South Vietnam. A Buddhist monk puts himself on fire, lights himself on fire, uh, to protest Diem. Uh, the suppression of Buddhists in South Vietnam became known as the Buddhist crisis. Uh, President Diem did little to ease the tensions, though he later promised reforms. Many people suspected that his brother, a close advisor, uh, knew. Uh, was the actual decision maker in the Saigon government and the person behind the Budapest suppression, or rather the Buddhist suppression. Uh, the Buddhist demonstrations continued through the spring and summer and culminated in June when a Buddhist monk publicly lit himself on fire and that photograph went around the world. John Kennedy is now, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? Tell me, Robert McNamara, Secretary of Defense, what do I do? Kennedy tried to impress upon Diem the need for major government reforms in Saigon, but Diem ignored him. In August, Diem declared martial law, and his forces uh, raided the pagodas of the Buddhist group behind the protests. Soon after, South Vietnamese military officers called the Pentagon and said, uh, you wouldn't mind if we staged a little coup here, would you? I mean, you know, what do you think? What do you think? Can we stage good? Dwight Eisenhower with the end. John Kennedy 
DM. They gave him millions upon millions upon millions of dollars. Um, and uh, they expected him to listen. On September 2nd, Kennedy gives an interview with old Iron Pants, Walter Cronkite, which he said the regime has gotten out of touch with the people. Uh, on November 1st, South Vietnamese generals used a strong military force to seize control of several, st several strategically important outposts in Saigon and other areas of South Vietnam. Uh, Diem and his brother, no, we're not surrendering. Uh, when it became clear that they were powerless, they used a secret exit to escape the presidential palace. They ducked into a Catholic church. They're found there by uh, Dong Vin Min, Big Min, said execute those guys. They were executed. Kennedy is stunned and upset when he learns about that war. Meanwhile, in Iraq, the second Iraq coup of 1963 takes place on November 13th, ends on November 18th, following back party divisions, pro nasturist Iraqi uh, officers led a military coup with the Ba'ath Party, Nazarists were uh, people who uh, supported Nasser in Egypt. Uh, the coup was brought bloodless, 250 people were killed in related actions. Uh, Nasserists named after the Egyptian president, Gamal Abdul Nasser, favored Arab unity. And this takes us to November 22nd, 1963. John Kennedy is addressing the uh, Chamber of Commerce in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. Early in the morning. I'm going to give you a story you haven't heard. Uh, my friend, the late Mark Schneider, worked at uh, the Associated Press. And uh, Mark and I were, were tight, uh, even though he was 25 years older than me. And uh, Larry O'Brien was the commissioner of the National Basketball Association in the, the mid 1970s to the early 1980s. And that's when I got to know Larry O'Brien. But Mark was with the Associated Press. He goes out to breakfast with Larry one day. And Larry tells him the story. And Mark told me the story. He says, uh, Kennedy's in Texas campaigning. And the last day, November 22nd, is the end of a three-day campaign swing. They come into Fort Worth, Texas. They're going to have a little rally in Fort Worth, Texas, and then go over to Dallas on November 22nd. Kennedy is looking for votes, and he knows he has to tie down Texas if he's going to be real life. Can't sleep, calls Larry. Larry is part of the uh, Kennedy Mafia, the Irish Mafia. Even though they weren't all Irish, it was uh, Powers and uh, Kenneth O'Donnell, the chief of staff, Pierre Salinger, the press secretary, uh, Theodore Sorensen, uh, the uh, Norwegian, who really wrote everything Kennedy said. Uh, so, Larry's part of that group, and Kennedy calls him, let's take a walk. You know, when you're president of the United States, you just can't take a walk. They go up to the roof of the hotel, the Texas Hotel in Fort Worth, and they're walking around. It's before sunrise, it's raining, it's cloudy, but they're walking around there. And Kennedy turns to Larry O'Brien, this is a story Marv told me, and he says, you know, Larry, it's a great big world out there. Anybody can get me. Well, it is raining. It's Fort Worth. And there's a little crowd in front of the hotel, so Kennedy and his advisors say, yeah, let's go out and talk to the crowd. Not a bad thing. We'll go out and talk to the crowd. And he does, in the rain. Um, and, um, you yeah, know, platform set up. He's wearing no protection against the weather. Makes some brief remarks. Uh, and then he uh, goes inside. He's going to meet the Chamber of Commerce. And he says, there are no faint parts in Fort Worth. I appreciate you being here this morning. Mrs. Kennedy is organizing herself. It takes a little longer. But, of course, she looks better than we do when she does it. Typical male response in 1963. He went on to talk about the nation's need for being second to none in defense and space continued growth in the economy and the willingness of citizens of the United States to assume the burdens of leadership. Final breakfast, Jackie gets there, finally, complete with the pillbox hat and the pink outfit. Uh, it's the last speech. 
and he continues talking about uh, uh, we are the keystone in the Arch of Freedom. We will continue to do our duty, and the people of Texas will be in the lead. Okay, so I don't know if you've ever been to Fort Worth and Dallas, but it's about a 40-minute ride between the two cities on the turnpike. Um, Kennedy instead takes a nine-minute flight from Fort Worth to Dallas, complete with the limousine. And uh, they touch down in Dallas, the limousine is rolled out, and there's going to be a motorcade. And this motorcade is well publicized. In fact, the Dallas Morning News, or the Dallas News, whatever it was called in those days, uh, has the route, the itinerary of the motorcade. And along some spots in the motorcade, Kennedy stops to shake hands with people. But the motorcade is approaching Dealey Plaza. Uh, around 12.30 in the afternoon. And there is Kennedy smiling, waving to the crowd. It's 12.30. Crowds of excited people by the streets wave to the Kennedy. The car turns off Main Street at Dealey Plaza at around 12.30. As it's passing the Texas School Book Depository, gunfire suddenly reverberates in the plaza. Bullets strike the uh, president's neck and head, slumped over towards Jackie Kennedy. Texas Governor John Connolly was shot in the back. He survived. Here's old Iron Pants. Tells the nation, or at least the CBS audience, Kennedy is dead. Stops. Takes off the glasses. Sheds a tear. Composes himself. Old Iron Pants is back in the saddle. With that, he becomes the most trusted man in America. The accused gunman is Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, they arrested him in the nearby movie theater. He recently was hired as an employee at the Texas School Book Depository. He's held for the assassination of John Kennedy and the fatal shooting of uh, afterwards of patrolman J.D. Tippett on the Dallas Street. Lyndon Johnson is sworn in by Sarah Hughes, a judge on Air Force One, Jackie Kennedy in her blood-splattered outfit. She's still wearing it. Why? She wants the world to see what happened. Um, they go onto the plane. They leave for Washington, D.C. Two days later, Jack Rubenstein, Jack Ruby, shoots Lee Harvey Oswald. Why is he there? He's a strip club owner. Apparently, he has free access to the police department. He just walks in, shoots Oswald. That's the end of that. Uh, that's November 24th. Viewers across America and across the world saw the uh, live television coverage when a man, uh, aimed with a pistol, shoots and fires at point blank range. Oswald died two hours later at uh, Parkland Hospital in the same area that John Kennedy died. The funeral is on uh, the 25th, uh, Monday, attended by uh, heads of state, representatives from more than 100 countries, millions more watching on TV. At the gravesite, Jacqueline Kennedy and her husband's brothers, Robert and Edward, lit an internal flame. Ever wonder what happened to the car? It sits in the Henry Ford Museum now. That's where the car is. And I'll read you about the car. A uh, tragic event occurs. The modern, new four-door convertible seemed well suited to a young, forward-thinking president who tragedy struck when President Kennedy was assassinated in November of 1963 while riding in his car through the streets of Dallas, Texas. As the world mourned, Secret Service took steps to have the vehicle rebuilt so it would better protect future presidents. Later modifications during the Johnson-Nixon presidency only served to illustrate, illustrate continued tension between the president's desire to be seen and the Secret Service efforts to protect them. The car was used again. The death car was used again. It sits in the Henry Ford Museum. Well, these guys had their first number one hit in 1963, and their last number one hit just last week, 60 years later. George, Paul, Ringo, and John. The Beatles. Walter Cronkite was going through a um, Airport in London, he sees Beatlemania, calls Ed Sullivan to alert him about this phenomenon. 
The Beatles' first American TV exposure, incidentally, was November 22, 1963, the CBS morning show with Mike Wallace. Wallace and his producers did a profile on the Beatles in a segment that was scheduled to be repeated on the nightly news show hosted by Walter Cronkite. It was shelved. Can't figure out why. Uh, it was uh, aired finally on December 10. Mercury astronauts, uh, 1963, their mission is completed. Uh, the space race Cold War heating up with the U.S. and the USSR wanting to land man on the moon first. The Mercury missions ended after NASA approved they could get astronauts in orbit around the Earth. Soviet Union put a woman in space. Congress was not sure if putting man on the moon was worth the cost, given problems that Americans had on Earth. Uh, that was the Prime Minister of Malaysia back in uh, 2010, a guy by the name of uh, Najib Razak, corrupt guy, ended up facing charges. Uh, Malaysia is formed, merging of uh, the Federation of Malaya and the British Crown Colony of Singapore, North Borneo, September 16th. The world is a dangerous place in 1963, September 25th, the Dominican Republic, one Bosch is deposed by a coup d'etat by, by the military with civilian support. October 14th, a revolution starts in Radfan, South Yemen, against British colonial rule. In Africa, the Organization of African Unity, 32 of the independent 32, 30 of the 32 independent countries meet in Ethiopia to form the Organization of African Unity. This came out of uh, W.E.B. Du Bois uh, and other African uh, intellectuals uh, to, to say, hey, look, unify Africa, unify. The organization stood for the eradication of colonialism, mutual defense, and the promotion of economic and social welfare of member states. Great Britain granted Kenya independence uh, within the British Commonwealth on December 12th. There was an artificial heart that was developed by Dr. Michael DeBakey in Houston, uh, and it was unveiled on July 19th. Approval was given for a vaccine against measles. John Enders developed the vaccine. Tito in uh, Yugoslavia made himself president for life. Um, Joseph Bras Tito, uh, changes to the European nation's name and Tito's authority were part of several socialist reforms. Uh, added to the country's constitution during that year. The portable television made its debut in Japan. They hit Japan, not the United States. And we leave with Camelot. Camelot. Life in Camelot. Uh, except there was no such thing as life in Camelot for John Kennedy. This is what happened. November 29th, Jacqueline Kennedy. Uh, four days after her husband's burial, and the widowed mother of two children invited Life magazine journalist Theodore H. White, or Weiss, to uh, the Kennedy family compound in Hyannisport, Massachusetts. They worked together. They were old friends. Jackie Kennedy was a photojournalist. She wanted White to help rescue her husband's legacy by linking his presidency to King Arthur and the Round Table. Camelot was running on Broadway. Uh, the lines he loved, the lines he loved to hear were, don't let it be forgotten that once there was a spot for one brief shining moment that was known as Camelot. It's fiction. Kennedy hated music. The long-term impact of 1963, Lyndon Johnson would sign the Civil Rights Act into law 1964. The Beatles conquered America and Ed Sullivan February 64. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was killed in 1968. Uh, Saddam Hussein would uh, get power in Iraq in 1968. Uh, Assad would become uh, or seize power in Syria uh, in 1969. The United States escalated its Vietnam involvement in 1964. The Warren Commission said Oswald acted alone in assassinating Kennedy. Khrushchev, the Soviet leader, would be ousted in 1964. Man landed on the moon. American men landed on the moon in 1969. And this John Lewis who became a congressman, being beaten up, another picture capturing what was going on in the set. Tito would die in 1980. Yugoslavia would break apart. 
Saddam Hussein would terrorize his people, was toppled in 2003, hanged in 2006. John Lewis, the last of the big six, would pass away in 2020. The Assad family still runs Syria. Women in the United States are still seeking equal pay for the same job. Thank you very much. Any comments? Just looking at me.